very much for uh, coming tonight and participating in our green building uh, seminar. Um, I know it takes a lot of uh, time out of your day to uh, muster up the energy and come on over here. I really appreciate you uh, coming and joining us. Um, the first thing I want to mention is that this is quite an amazing uh, session that we're able to pull this off now trying to get to video production level and it's all being done by volunteers uh, so i want to thank, thank all of you that uh, contribute either your dollars or your membership to helping us uh, keep this production up uh, your donations uh, help keep us um, keep the lights on I wanted to point out uh, one of our volunteers tonight that I, I think you'll be hearing a lot more from. Um, imagine last session we had a speaker that brought his tiny home, actually a converted box truck. And um, <clears throat> the night before he was to arrive here, uh, his truck got stolen. <laughs> And he ended up, and, and he, he was in it when it was getting stolen. So uh, in a panic, um, he jumped out the, the door, the back of the truck, and he got badly injured. I got a call, I think about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I thought, who could be calling me in the morning that early? And it was him. And he was telling me that he thought he might not be able to show up. But uh, he asked if I knew anyone that could um, come and help him because they, they had driven his truck right underneath a, a bridge and had torn the, the top of the truck up. And you know, I, I called around to my Eco Builder community, and Doug said, you know, maybe Brian can give him a hand. And I called Brian, and Brian said, sure. Where is he? <laughs> so Brian, uh, if you could stand up. This is our volunteer of the month. And not only did Brian go in and help him with his truck, Brian actually uh, told him what parts he needed, and within a week uh, got the, the truck uh, fixed up, and, and at least enough um, uh, fixed so that it could be uh, used for the exhibit, and then they finished it off uh, the rest of the week. So, Brian, thanks again for volunteering to do that. And by the way, Brian is also the person that offers his office for us to meet on a monthly basis. So uh, a real uh, lot of appreciation there. Um, and you'll meet a lot of these, these volunteers that participate and are so motivated in this grassroots movement to build green uh, that um, this is like our meeting place to, to hang out and talk about all our tree hugger stuff. Um, I wanted to point out the volunteers that come here and help set us set up the, the furniture with Doug um, um, guiding that operation. And um, there's the food to be set up, the AV to be set up. And all of this takes a little bit of time from, from a lot of us. Um, so as I go through the, the different volunteer roles, if you're interested, all, I, all we need is like, you know, 10 minutes of your time to help us set up. And then as you get uh, more familiar with what we do, you might want to volunteer even more time, like a month, uh, one, one hour a month or two hours a month, depending on what you're interested in doing. The check-in is handled by Eric. Eric, raise your hand, please. So if you want to uh, learn how we do the check-in, talk to Eric. The furniture, uh, take a uh, set up and take down. Doug Kennedy, where's Doug? Everybody knows Doug, and Doug also helps set up the food. So if you come in early and the food is still laying back there, go ahead and set it up. Membership is being handled by um, Eric, Eric uh, Tomasian um, over at the front. And we also need a timer, and thank you, Kathy, for offering, us to, uh, offering to be the timer tonight. That keeps us on schedule. The audiovisual is being handled uh, usually by myself. Uh, or Aliko over here. Thank you, Aliko. And we're looking for a stage manager. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, Hannah is doing that job today, so raise your hand, Hannah. 
If you want to know how to do, if you want to practice doing video stage managing, see Hannah. Um, I wanted to introduce Julie Rodwell tonight. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Laura, can you come up here? Yeah. <laughs> Green Altar. So very quickly, I'm going to introduce Julie Rodwell yesterday. We are going to have the Northwest Green Home Tour again. I think it's our eighth annual and uh, it's going to be April 28th and 29th. The 28th we have sites that are on the east side and the um, south and west Seattle area and then on Sunday it will be the north end of town. And so you can go to lots and lots of sites and not get caught up in traffic crossing town. Uh, we are still looking for volunteers to help with the site. So day of volunteers are site readers and they have two different shifts, four hours on um, a shift. And you are key personnel on the site and making sure that everybody has a little green wristband or has signed a waiver so that if someone does hurt themselves, they can't sue us, the guild, the contractors, the homeowners, the liability thing, and it's super important in today's society. Unfortunately, <laughs> so there's a sign up uh, opportunity right over here on the computer, and I'm also going to pass around. Oh, and Julie has a sign up clipboard. You want to raise it again, Julie? So you can see who you are. There we go. Um, and I'm going to pass around these cards. Feel free to take one for yourself, for your friend. If you have a business that thinks you should have some on their desk front, please take a little stack for them. Um, and we have some more at the table if these run out before they get to you. Um, can I put a different hat on real quick? Please. All right, second hat <laughs> is that the um, Northwest Green Building Slam and Summit Committee is now gathering, and we have uh, some great opportunities for volunteerism on that committee. The event will be in late October this year, and um, it's a really fun group. We meet um, virtually and in person so that it can meet other people's um, personal lives and needs. And uh, if you're interested in that, let me know. Yeah, you have something done? We got it. We got it. Okay. Just thought it might be nice to acknowledge our sponsors for the Green Home Store and Green Home Solutions, Small Planet Supply, and Mighty Energy. So thank you for supporting that. Thanks, Doug. And I also wanted to point out uh, Mighty Energy. Uh, Laura back there. Mighty Energy uh, provides infrared radiant heating solutions that are not only efficient but also greatly contribute to the health, healthy indoor environment. Um, the other sponsor is uh, Small Planet Supply. Small Planet is dedicated to, <clears throat> to supply education and training of energy efficient buildings and materials and practice. And um, Green Home Solutions, Pater, raise your hand, please. Okay, so Pater runs uh, Green Home Solutions uh, down in Ballard. Uh, it is the only locally owned and operated uh, building supply company. So go down and visit them. They're actually doing the uh, tiny home uh, hub as well as uh, um, their store on the 28th of April Green Home Tour. Okay. Um, Any of you available to help put away the furniture tonight? Great, thank you, thank you. We're gonna, it's gonna be a little longer night tonight, but uh, we're gonna try and get out of here by 9.30. So if you can help us with the furniture, that's gonna help us stay on time. Okay, so let's get on with the March um, materials for healthy home and a plant. This is a, this is a fantastic panel that Brian has pulled together. Uh, some really quality people coming up here. Brian, you want to come on up? Brian Cohen. Yeah, thank you all for coming out. So um, I don't want to take any more time away from our speakers. So the first speaker we have is uh, Clark Peterson with Synthesis Consultants. Thank you. 
Uh, hello, all. Um, you know where it is? Uh, my name is Tor Peterson. Um, I actually am recently back in town after about five years away um, in central Illinois. So it's, it's fun to see some familiar faces and, uh, um, and some new ones as well. Um, a little bit on my background, um, I worked for the City of Seattle's Green Building Program from almost its inception, right around the year 2000 um, until 2007, um, and worked mostly on the residential program. Um, I then moved to uh, the what is now the International Living Future Institute, um, what was the Cascadia Green Building Council at that time. Uh, and when they were launching the Living Building Challenge. So a big chunk of what I'll be talking, and since then, I've been running my own consultancy synthesis, uh, where I worked with um, architects, building owners, um, local governments to uh, build out green building programming and uh, specifically technically consult on, on individual projects. So um, I am not a health professional. I know enough about this stuff to be dangerous, I think, um, and I hope I can impart a similar level of uh, peril on you all. Um, I'm trying to figure out how it is. Um, but uh, we've got three different presenters tonight, and um, it's really an amazing brain trust in terms of the other presenters. I know that I'll be. Um, um, I wanted to talk a little bit um, about it at sort of the 30,000 foot level, um, give a bit of an introduction to just the concept of toxicology and how it um, relates to um, building materials selection and use, um, and then go through a list of what I consider some of the sort of worst in class or chemical nasties that end up in buildings. Unfortunately, it's a large and growing list, um, so I'm going to zip through it as quickly as possible. I also had a bit of heartache trying to pull slides out of my presentation. Um, it's probably an hour and a half worth of stuff that I'm going to try to cram into 30 minutes. So, um, so bear with me. Um, it's going to go pretty quickly. Um, so, with that, I will start. I wanted to start with a pop, pop quiz. Um, just uh, ask you all to connect the chemical nasty on the left with the impact on the right. Uh, so just shout it out. We'll go through quickly through this. But um, uh, what is lead connected to on the right hand column? Rome. Fall of Rome, exactly. Um, uh, theories around uh, lead pipes for water delivery that actually ended up um, you know, impacting the population's health. Um, mercury. Mad Hatter. Hatter? Yes. Um, uh, mercury was used in um, felting uh, for felt hats. Um, and uh, led to a bunch of neurological problems with, with um, Milner's back in the day. Asbestos. Yeah, exactly. So a uh, type of uh, lung cancer um, from asbestos exposure. DDT. Birds. Birds, exactly. DDT would thin the shells of birds, especially at the top of the food chain. Um, and uh, uh, because DDT is a, is a bioaccumulating substance, so those top of the food chain animals really get hit the hardest. And process of elimination, malite. Those, yeah, those crazy FEMA trailers from uh, Katrina that were full of uh, formaldehyde and basically uh, making people sick. So yeah, exciting stuff that's out there, and this is all stuff that's in the environment and has been for years and years, millennia in some cases. Um, that we've known the health effects from and still have a devil of a time getting it out of our building products. Um, so a little basics when it comes to toxicology. Um, just what is toxicology? It's the study of the adverse effects of chemicals on humans and other um, living organisms. But really, uh, it comes from a public health perspective. Most of the toxicological information that you'll get out there um, is related to human health. Um, it's inherently multidisciplinary. Um, it's a confluence of chemistry, biology, the medical uh, literature, um, and uh, state of knowledge, and pharmacology. Basically, pharmacology, the study of drug impacts on humans, is the um, intended effects uh, side of the coin from toxicology, toxicology, which is basically just the exposure that we um, endure of everything else. Um, there are a ton of variables 
that um, lead up to uh, a toxicological profile, if you will. Um, so uh, is the exposure over time or is it a one-time event? Is the exposure to one chemical or a big soup of them? Um, what's the half-life of the chemical of concern that we're talking about? In other words, how long does it take for 50% of the toxicity or volume of that chemical to um, degrade and or uh, become inert? Um, and different chemicals have different half-lives. So formaldehyde, for example, has a half-life of roughly 20 years. So if you put a formaldehyde-laden piece of composite wood in your house, 20 years later, it's still emitting half as much formaldehyde as it was the day you put it in. It means it's sticking around for a long time. Um, and then degradation products as well. So uh, a lot of chemicals break down into the constituent elements over time. Um, perchloroethylene, which is a, um, it's a dry cleaning fluid, um, itself has a, rel a relatively benign toxicological profile, but it breaks down into vinyl chloride, which is actually also the building block for PVC, um, and that's a known human carcinogen. So in some cases, when the stuff breaks down, it um, forms even nastier components, and that's something you need to be aware of. Um, so what, when we say risk, what are we talking about? It's actually a combination of the hazard itself, in this case, the chemical hazard and its profile, like what is it going to do to you? What target organ in your body is it going to, is it going to affect, for example, and exposure. So without exposure, the hazard is rendered relatively inert, at least on a sort of philosophical level. I mean, you could take a chunk of uranium, and if you encase it in lead, it, you're not going to actually have radioactive exposure to that, to that um, substance. Um, same thing with lead-based paint, for example. There are encapsulation technologies, so you basically put a layer between you and the chemical nasty, and that keeps it out of, out of the equation. It's one of the reasons we're much more concerned about internal or uh, indoor exposures to chemicals because uh, that exposure route is much more direct um, and we're getting a lot more of it. Uh, so let's see, there are different routes for exposure. It's more toxicology 101 stuff. So you can ingest it. Um, that is a primary mode for um, lead exposure in children. It's chewing on that piece of lead-based paint. It's uh, drinking lead contaminated water from uh, water systems that are leaching it uh, to the whole Flint disaster in a nutshell. Uh, inhalation is another. So the compounds out there that volatilize easily, that turn to a gas, um, that's how you're going to be um, encountering those. And then skin is the third route of exposure. So transdermal expo uh, uh, exposure is what they call that. And uh, in, in an extra creepy turn, in my opinion, it turns out that our eyes are actually um, a, a significant route of exposure because of that, treating them as, as a skin membrane. Um, uh, we can get a lot of exposure um, to gases through, through our eyes, actually. Um, and then uh, a big element of, uh, of uh, toxicology in terms of understanding outcomes is just facing the fact that there's pretty tremendous individual variability out there. Um, your age, your weight, um, your uh, health status, and previous exposures to chemicals will all uh, play a part in determining um, the impact on, on an, at an individual basis. So a lot of toxicology is sort of looking at the population level. Um, there are canaries in the coal mine out there. There are folks that have um, multiple chemical sensitivity, for example, um, or other uh, health uh, uh, sort of immune suppression and other um, health issues that uh, make them uniquely uh, um, uh, vulnerable. Uh, so in terms of effects, uh, basically, these chemicals can target a particular organ. It may be your kidneys, it may be your liver, it may be a system in your body, your immune system, your neurological system, your endocrine system, so those hormone-mocking compounds that we hear about um, uh, out there that would be uh, affecting your endocrine system, um, so on and so forth. Um, and then there are also just the general outcomes, like does it cause cancer? Uh, anyone out there know what a teratogen is? Have you heard that term? That is um, a chemical that affects 
the developmental process of the of the embryo, basically. So that's a particular type. There are a series of chemicals that actually do serious damage um, during that very fragile stage of development. So what, is, what does all this have to do with us? Well, <laughs> our houses are sort of the perfect toxicological experiment. Um, the EPA estimates that um, the average American, um, which I like to think is probably not the average Pacific Northwesterner, but uh, spends 90% of our time indoors. Um, we are an indoor species at this point. Um, we, uh, our homes ourselves are basically these little chemical mixing chambers. Um, they're exposing us to a whole mix of chemical compounds um, in, in combinations that have not been studied, have not been evaluated. Um, it's estimated that there are 85,000 chemicals in commerce at this point, and we're adding thousands every year. Um, and regulation is not keeping up, evaluation is not keeping up. Um, more than three quarters of these have essentially no health data on them. And when I say no health data, I mean they haven't even tested in a test tube to see if it reacts with human cells in a particular way. They haven't even tested it um, at that most basic of levels, or even run computer algorithms to figure out whether if the computer, if the, uh, the chemical compound, if it's analogous to others that they've got in, uh, in a database, whether it might be a, a potential chemical concern. So we're really flying in the dark on a lot of fronts when it comes to chemicals in human health. Um, we've also tightened up our homes, um, but as the old green building aphorism says, built tight, but ventilate right. So if we've got the proper ventilation strategy in place, which we should have if we're the right type of green builder, um, dilution still is part of the solution to pollution. Um, but the best thing to do is source control to actually keep these things out of our homes in the first place. It's just uh, difficult to figure out what we're trying to keep out if we don't have any uh, red flags to show us that the particular chemicals of concern are chemicals of concern. Um, so this mix of, uh, of uh, chemicals coming not only from our building materials, but all the other stuff that you see on this list here that I won't go through, um, leads to a, a challenging scenario, to say the least, at this point um, in our evolution as a species. Um, as sort of an endpoint barometer, I thought this study that was done now over 10 years ago um, shows you the paucity of information that's out there on this, on this stuff. Um, but a, a bunch of uh, environmental nonprofits in the Pacific Northwest got together and basically co-funded this study where they just took 10, 10 Washington residents, and these were people like um, uh, Dennis Hayes from the Bullet Center <laughs> and some other sort of top uh, kind of environmental uh, uh, muckety mucks, if you will, from, from the day. Um, and they drew their blood and they tested them for a variety of basically groups of chemicals. So phthalates, which we've heard of before, PVDEs, um, which are uh, flame retardants, um, heavy metals, perfluorocarbons, um, which are sort of your um, uh, uh, Teflon category of products, pesticides, PCBs, and DDT. And what they found is that everyone had within uh, between 26 six and 39 chemicals present in their bloodstream when they were tested. They also found that everyone tested positive for phthalates and for PCBs. And remember that PCBs were outlawed for production um, decade, decades before this test was done. So we've got PCB exposures that are happening to us because it's out there in the environment and PCBs are one of those bioaccumulating substances that actually work its way up the uh, food chain and amplify over time. They're also extremely persistent in the environment. They don't break down over time. Um, half of the study group, five of the 10 folks, um, tested positive for uh, carbaryl, which is a pesticide and a known carcinogen. Again, it's something that's been phased out of, um, of active use, but, uh, and it's a pesticide, so we're applying it to our agricultural crops, and somehow it's um, coming back into our bloodstream. Um, those routes of exposure are, uh, can be tortuous at times. And three of 10 actually had mercury levels that were beyond the safe levels. So um, long story short, when it came to this study, um, 
even the cleanest living, you know, hermetically sealed as they hope they are folks uh, that are out there um, are still having troubling exposures to environmental pollutants. Um, I wanted to throw this one in here just as a sort of uh, segue. I don't think that unhealthy materials are the process or the product of nefarious individuals that are trying to get us sick. Um, basically, these chemicals are in the products because they serve a purpose, but what they're missing is the unintended consequences. So we put, where, where am I? Oh God, is my, is my 30 minutes already over? Um, uh, I, I won't wax philosophical on this, but basically what I'll say quickly is that um, I think that we need to broaden our perspective on the design process and think about health outcomes from the outset. And if we do that, we can actually design out of the issue, um, out of the process, uh, many, many of these issues. I put the lawn darts up there because that was, that was my initial thought is, the person that invented lawn darts didn't think that they were gonna end up being a lethal weapon, um, that the kids were gonna end up like getting killed by this lawn toy. But they were, um, and when they was the one that was found out, was, was my half hour already? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, anyhow, well, I still have twenty minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so the my point here being that um, I don't think this is an intentional thing. I think what it is is narrow narrow mindedness in on the design end of things. That uh, product manufacturers aren't looking at the at the totality of outcome that is happening. Um, lead was put into paint to make paint last longer, not to poison children, for example. Mercury is put in fluorescent light bulbs because they wouldn't work without it, um, but it's a neurotoxin. So these are some of those issues that we need to, we need to deal with. The big problem is, um, and this is partly due to our regulatory regime here in the United States, um, that says that pretty much anyone has the right to start a business and put something out into the marketplace and they don't have to prove that it's safe. They um, can get sued afterward to clean up their mess or if they cause harm to individuals, but really that's the only breaks on the system when it comes to the, when it comes to US regulations. You uh, are really kind of free to do what you want to do until you cause harm. And I'll show in some later slides how the European Union has actually um, uh, developed an alternative to, to that approach that seems to be pretty, working pretty well to keep um, these chemical nasties out of the supply chain um, in Europe, at least, and then maybe it's something that we can follow once uh, we've got regime change here. Um, let's see, okay, so I'm quickly going to go through a series of what um, I would consider some of the primary current hazards in building materials um, uh, at the moment. And this is the list, and I will go through these one by one real quick. Like. So first one is uh, VOC emitting products. Um, I think we hear the term VOC all the time now. What does it stand for? A volatile organic compound. What does that mean? Basically organic in that case does not mean something good. It just means carbon-based. So as, as in we are a carbon-based life form. So we are organic. Um, so uh, the other aspect of the volatile in volatile organic compound means that it, it will uh, readily evaporate at ambient room temperature, basically. Um, and then it becomes an exposure route, inhalation, back to, the, back to that toxicology 101. It's a really big mix of chemicals that have a variety of, of troubling um, endpoints or sometimes are completely innocuous. And the interesting thing about uh, the VOC standards that we'll see um, coming out of EPA and California, for example, is that they're not defined on human health, direct human health impact. It's not that these gases that are formed out of the products that we're breathing, or that, you know, the gases that we're breathing out of the products that um, we're installing in our homes um, or painting onto our homes in the case of paints. Uh, it's not that they're immediately toxic to us, it's that they create smog um, because they go through a photoreaction um, when they uh, are exposed to UV radiation and end up um, creating um, asthma attacks and other long troubling events down the road. So it's, uh, 
in my mind, these VOC limits that you see out of the California Air Resources Board or what have you, um, since they're based on smog, um, people use it as a health proxy, but it's a rough one. Um, and it's again back to sort of regulations driving the discussion. Where do you find these things? They're in paints and finishes, they're in adhesives, um, carpets off gas, composite wood products, <coughs> furniture that has, um, all of these things can end up having a variety of uh, volatile organic compounds. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, formaldehyde, particularly urea formaldehyde. Um, so urea formaldehyde is, is a resin that, uh, that uh, off gas is much more than other types of um, resin products. So you'll, you'll see phenolic resins as the um, alternative to urea formaldehyde, but it's, uh, phenolic resins are still a formaldehyde based product. The formaldehyde is just bound into the matrix of the resin to the point where it doesn't off gas. Um, so formaldehyde is an example of a VOC. Um, this is where you'll find it, wood fabrics, insulation products, um, your jeans that you might have bought from Levi's that had those permanent creases in them, uh, those can be uh, created by formaldehyde. Um, there are now products that manufacturers are putting into urea formaldehyde resin uh, composite wood products to make them uh, not emit so much formaldehyde. These products are called scavenger molecules, so melamine, hexamine, these other products. Um, in my mind, that's a little bit of the uh, teaching to the test where they don't want to change their formulation substantially, so they just put in some other compounds to see if they can reduce the amount of emissions. Um, better choice is to go completely away from the, uh, these uh, urea formaldehyde-based products. I'm sure that Peter and other uh, presenters will be talking about those product alternatives. I'm not going to dwell on that because I'm already over time, or it will be soon enough. Um, so what's the problem with urea formaldehyde? It's an asthmogen, so it actually um, can elicit uh, an, asthma, uh, an asthma attack in an individual. Uh, the U.S. has it categorized as a likely human carcinogen, but Europe says, yep, that's exactly what it is. This is a cancer-causing agent. Other hazards, um, and these, some of these have been around for a very long time, heavy metals. So you've got lead, you've got mercury, you've got cadmium and chromium, and what are called organotins. So tin as an element is actually um, pretty innocuous, but if you add an organic molecule to it, you can met, if you methylate that tin, um, it becomes extremely to toxic and bioaccumulative. So um, those are just some examples of heavy metals, and you'll find them in polyvinyl chloride products where they act as stabilizers um, because PVC breaks down in UV um, light pretty readily. So uh, PVC siding, the vinyl siding, will often have a lot of lead in it, um, and people don't know about that. It was in paints, um, not so much anymore, but old solder in pipes um, where it leaches into uh, water pipes, actual water pipes are made of lead, old ones. Um, and even fixtures today, this is a little funny little factoid, um, EPA now has a lead-free designation for uh, plumbing fixtures that you'll see. Um, they still can contain up to something like 12% lead <laughs> and be called lead-free because it's about how much lead is leaching from the, oops, leaching from the, um, from the plumbing fixture rather than its total content. Um, again, it's that exposure, um, exposure route component. Um, these are all the bad endpoints that you can get. Again, cancer, neurotoxins, that's a big thing with heavy metals, especially lead. Um, and mercury is that they destroy the neurological system. And they bioaccumulate, so they stay in your body for a very long time and amplify as it goes up the, the food chain. Phthalates are another that we'll hear a lot about. Um, PVC is not only naturally uh, fragile in daylight, and so you have to put lead into it, but PVC is also naturally brittle, and so you have to add a plasticizer to make it supple and movable. Um, and uh, historically, the, um, the plasticizer that has been used in PVC has been phthalates. Um, phthalates are a home hormone mocking substance, so um, they, looked, they look a lot like estrogen to the body. Uh, they will dis disrupt 
um, hormonal activity because of that. Um, I put here that they're not bioaccumulative, but, but that shows like the how uncertain we are about the science around these things. In Europe, once again, they're starting to call um, phthalates as a bioaccumulating substance. So they very well may be, we just, the, the science is still out. The problem is that it leaches out of, of products and can volatilize. So you can either ingest it or inhale it. BPA was one that we heard a lot about back with the Nalgene water bottles um, and in these, in these sort of sport bottle contexts. But uh, bisphenol A is still everywhere. It is ridiculous how much of this stuff we use in commerce. Eight billion pounds annually, billion. That's, that's over a pound a person. Um, uh, that just blows my mind. Given how tiny amounts of this product can actually act as a hormone disruptor, um, and uh, we're now finding stronger and stronger linkages to cancer. Um, so where are these things? We've gotten them out of our Nalgene bottles, but they're still in polycarbonate products. Um, they're very much present, probably, I don't know, I would say 80% of the 8 billion pounds is used in resins and adhesives, where it's actually Actually, they take advantage of the fact that it volatilizes so easily. It's the thing that basically dries and cures those resin products. So the, the cool, um, you know, uh, bar countertops that you see with the um, clear finishes, shiny, watery finishes that you put over whatever, um, those are um, cured in place often with BPA. Flame retardants are a big one um, as well. They're in all sorts of uh, products. Um, here in Washington State, we you know, got ahead of the curve, or not ahead of the curve, but at least we were responsive to the threat by identifying um, some of the more concerning of the flame retardants, the polybrominated diphenyl ethers, that, um, um, but ban them in specific products. So in furniture, in children's toys, um, these flame retardants have, have now been phased out of production, but they're still very present in foam insulation products, for example, uh, is, is the big one. Um, it's estimated that something like 85% of the brominated fire retardant um, volume that's out there is embedded in these foam um, insulation products for the most part. And that at some point um, it's, you know, it's slowly leaching out um, throughout use, but also becomes a huge um, issue at disposal because these, uh, um, these compounds um, are extremely persistent in the environment. Um, they stick around for a very long time. We don't seem to know when they might break down or really what they might break down into. Shifting gears on the sort of human-made chemical nasties um, are the biological contaminants. I'm only going to barely touch on this, but uh, for those of you interested in this whole topic, uh, think about the Healthy Home Builder class coming, um, coming up this fall. Uh, if you really want to dig into the details here, but um, there are many, many products that just are really good at facilitating the growth of, of mold. And then there are installation and maintenance practices that um, kind of push that into the stratosphere in terms of the incidence of, of, of these uh, of mold and other biological growth in your home. Um, yeah, again, can't go into detail just because of uh, time constraints, but it's a big deal. And on the other side of that equation is that we've got um, more and more antimicrobial products that are getting um, tossed into our homes because we are generating this, um, I think there's a legitimate concern for inhalation of, of certain mold spores, but we're also just developing a generalized germophobia, I think, um, in our culture. And so we want everything to be um, uh, antimicrobial so that we won't be getting bugs when we touch a, a door handle or what have you. Um, it's turning out that most of these applied, in fact, um, there's no evidence that any of these substances, whether it's in your hand wash or you're applying it, you know, or factory applied to your countertop or to the inside of your refrigerator, that they do any good from a public health perspective. And a lot of them are actually escaping in the environment and, um, and you're being exposed to them 
And the thing is, if it's toxic to a microorganism, it's probably not good for you either. Uh, think, you know, think in those terms. So, um, you know, one of, one of the biggest concerns around this is uh, that we may be actually breeding superbugs by putting these um, compounds out into the environment and basically killing off the more benign ones and only the nastiest that survive um, uh, being allowed to uh, repopulate the, the, the population. Uh, back to the chemicals. <laughs> perfluorocar uh, chemicals, uh, perfluorocarbons um, are another um, category of highly persistent um, uh, chemicals. These are the, the old Scotchgard and Stainmaster um, materials that have been, um, are, are we're slowly actually phasing out of production because they're entering the um, our groundwater <laughs> and we're, we're finding them in very uh, concerning places like polar bear milk um, because they're migrating everywhere um, in the world. Um, in some ways to me this feels like a Kurt Vonnegut book. It's like it's one of those things where it's like okay well we froze all of the ice on the planet and all the water into, on the planet into ice because we didn't want our soldiers to get their feet muddy. <laughs> you know, in battle, it's that same sort of unintended consequence where, you know, we didn't want to stain our outfit or our couch. And uh, so we invented this stuff that seems to last longer than the pyramids. Um, and then uh, there's this whole other category that I just wanted to throw in there, like sort of a, a hodgepodge, and that's contaminants that are in existing building products. Um, these are toxins that um, aren't even listed on the, in, in the product literature because uh, they weren't intended to be there or maybe the manufacturer just cut some corners and it ended up with this stuff in them. Examples would be the hydrogen sulfides that were in the Chinese drywall that was coming in right before the, last, right before the Great Recession when we were importing a whole bunch of um, drywall from abroad. Um, mercury and synthetic gypsum that we're creating right here um, we create synthetic gypsum out of the gases that we pull out of coal-fired power plants, and then we turn it into a slurry and make it into panels and put it into our house. So these, like, that seems so insane to me that we're actually making building products out of basically the stuff that gets caught in the catalytic converter of a, of a, of a coal-fired power plant, because those things are full of... Um, uh, all sorts of uh, heavy metals and, and other concerning products. But y'all might also remember the um, uh, bamboo and, and composite wood floorings that were um, being um, ID'd as having huge formaldehyde emissions rates. Um, those were also imported. So uh, I think the trick here is to identify local products that you can uh, get the provenance of uh, get the story behind them, know where they're coming from, um, and don't have these attenuated uh, supply chains that are really, really hard to, to nail down. Um, I wanted to put this one in there as sort of a question mark because we're still figuring it out, and I think there will be more than a few of these that we say, oh my god, why did we put that out into the environment? Um, nanomaterials. Um, in a lot of ways, they're seen as, you know, the the manufacturing uh, potential of the future, uh, carbon fiber, for example, but carbon nanotubes have been shown to create um, health problems in, um, in uh, lab animals that look very similar to asbestosis. Um, so they seem to perform a lot like a, an asbestos fiber when you, get, when you inhale them. They, um, depending on the material, say nano silver or um, um, other other uh, metallic uh, products at the nanoscale can pass the blood brain barrier and can insinuate into the cellular structure um, of individual cells and damage DNA. Uh, they, just because of their surface to mass ratio, they have a completely different toxicological profile from the macro version of themselves. So uh, nano silver, again, why, why we put it on things? Because it kills bacteria. <laughs> That's why it's in like, your sweat pants or what have you. Um, well, it's killing those little tiny organisms. Um, is it good for us? So to me, that's the regulatory wild west. And on that front, 
We've got one minute left, so I'm going to go through this super quickly. Um, I will just say that the U.S. regulatory context is basically, um, it's a mess. And like I said before, it's based on mitigating harm after the release rather than, um, and, and how I've seen it put is how much harm will we tolerate? Um, EPA will base um, tolerances on, okay, one cancer death in a million is okay. Um, that seems like one too many to me, but um, that's the way the regulatory regime tends to work here. The alternative would be what you can see in, in Europe where they based um, their uh, regulations on, on the cautionary principle, which basically is the concept of prudent avoidance. If we don't know enough about this, how about we don't put it in the marketplace yet? Um, so a few last things, just because I'm down to the last few minutes, but um, there, are there are certification systems out there for a variety of products. Um, they, it's a hodgepodge at this point. It can be very confusing to the, to the average consumer or even to a professional that's trying to specify products um, for a project. Um, this, this is just a quick smattering of some of those. Some answers that are out there, in my opinion. Um, so the uh, International Living Future Institute, based here in Seattle, um, has the uh, red list, which is um, their list of the, the top chemical nasties that are out there. Highly recommend checking out the Living Future Institute's website and their red list. They've got a, um, a voluntary program called Declare, where they're, they're getting product manufacturers to be transparent about what is in their products. A similar thing is happening at the international level with what are called health product declarations. Again, voluntary um, scenarios where um, we finally have a standardized form for manufacturers to list the ingredients of their products and the, and the known hazards. So this is coming from like, you know, uh, it's coming from a, a third party from a nonprofit um, sense, but it relies on the honesty of the manufacturer um, for the most part. Um, greenwash is a big uh, concern. I just wanted to point out this one. Uh, example that uh, came to me while I was doing my research for this presentation. So Silestone, the, the quartz composite countertop, actually has um, microban, uh, which is one of those antimicrobials built into the surface of the product. Um, I would consider that a type of greenwash, that they're passing this off as a healthy aspect to their product when there's no um, evidence that microban or any of these um, antimicrobials actually do protect public health and in fact might cause public health harm. Um, so there are, there's guidance from the Federal Trade Commission on what you can claim about your product in terms of environmental performance. Um, not expecting a bunch of ac action from the feds these days uh, to actually you know, follow through on any of this stuff, but knowing that this stuff is on the books is important. Um, so just quickly some resources. Uh, the Healthy Building Network is a fantastic resource out there. They've got a resource, a sub-resource called Home Free that I would uh, highly recommend looking at. If you're more of an architect or a professional, the uh, Perkins and Will architectural firm has a transparency website um, where they go into the details on all of this stuff and you can really dig into it. The Living Future Institute, like I said, the Red List, these health product declarations, and even material safety data sheets all are are, are a good game. Yeah, question? Uh, one more to add to that list. Yes. Transparencycatalog.com is the final list. Uh, suppliers, many, excuse me, manufacturers on transparencycatalog.com. Okay. It's free for everybody to use, and you can get an LCA right there. Great. Mind repeating that into the mic, just so okay. So transparency, what's it called again? Transparencycatalog.com. Transparencycatalog.com. Resource from the audience. Sustainable Minds is the, the uh, brainchild behind that. Um, so, and between resources and advocacy, these things pass uh, both directions. Uh, what was the Washington Toxics Coalition here in Washington State is now uh, Toxic Free Future. Um, great advocacy group, they're the ones that got the PBDE ban um, through. Healthy Building Network, like I said, um, they do nonstop advocacy around this. 
Um, the Living Future Institute and Declare, I think, are both a resource and, and advocacy, and same with the health product declarations. So um, I know I'm a couple minutes over, so I'll give uh, one or two minutes for any questions that anyone might have. You still have five minutes for questions. Oh, still have five? Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess we've got a few minutes if there are, if there are any more questions or statements. Actually, you guys are brain trust too. Thank you for giving me additional resources. So, yep. What do you know about borates? What do I know about borates? I know that there is, so borates are used um, as an alternative to some of these brominated fire retardants. Um, borates are used in cellulose insulation, um, both for to confer fire retardants and um, moisture resistance um, and degradation over time to those cellulose fibers. Um, I know that there's been research in Europe that borates um, may have health concerns. Um, I, I haven't seen any research in the United States, but that's probably not surprising. Um, so, yeah. If you manufacture cellulose information, you have to have a test that says the possibility of toxic hazards to the unborn child and Okay, so right, yeah. So uh, again, the so comment from the audience. Um, so at the uh, safety data sheet level for borates, that there are uh, cautions around reproductive um, issues and for uh, and maternal issues. So uh, uh, with borates, so this is one where. We think of it as a, an innocuous substance. We just don't have a lot of research on it yet. The emerging consensus is that there are uh, distinct concerns um, around borates. So it doesn't leave a lot of <laughs> doesn't leave a lot of insulations out there that are um, sort of harm free, uh, which is which is really problematic. Um, I don't know, and maybe you do, if the low dust versions of um, cellulose insulations that are borate treated. Re, uh, result in less they exposure. Yeah, I don't know if um, coating. Uh -huh. Okay. It doesn't make it anymore. The other thing about fluorides too is they're more soluble, so if you get a leak or something like that, I got a combustion. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, it's water soluble. Hard to get around this stuff. It is hard to get around this stuff, and 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 maybe that's part of my take home is that there's there's no easy answer here. Um, one of the main ways I feel like I navigate all this stuff is keeping it simple. Like, don't have the like crazy number of materials in your materials palette for your house. Keep it simple, buy local, go with the minimally processed materials um, as you can, um, know the story behind the production process. Um, again, that's much easier to find out if it's, if it's a locally produced material. Um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, go in a lot of ways. What's old is new is, is new again. There are lots of old tried and true bio-based products that um, that work well. And um, but just because they're bio-based does not mean that they're non-toxic. So um, again, we'll look at those things as well. Um, additional questions or comments? We've got two other speakers with a wealth of, of information. Yes. So uh, briefly uh, elaborate on how much more serious Europe seems to be taking about all this stuff than we are here. Yeah. So the question was uh, elaborate a bit on what Europe's doing that we're not. Uh, so uh, Europe passed almost a decade ago now uh, what's called breach legislation, which is this uh, um, uh, precautionary principle-based um, approach to the release of, of uh, chemicals and products uh, that basically says that you've got to prove that they're benign before you can get a license to uh, manufacture and distribute. So it really is that it's the barrier before, rather than opening the floodgates, letting stuff go out there, um, and then a bunch of lawsuits happening <laughs> in response and people getting cancer, uh, they have put in place a series of protocols that require um, those manufacturers to, to prove the, that the products are relatively innocuous. Uh, I don't know the details on, on, on what the screening criteria are, how far down the pipe you have to go with that sort of thing. But, um, and, and if anyone else here. How serious are they about all that in Europe? Do they prosecute on that kind of stuff? 
Um, I know that it's heavily regulated, so um, I don't know about, um, you know, prosecutions as much as, like, just you don't get your license to produce <laughs> if you can't do it. So, um, and whether that might be. There's no vinyl in here. So go walk through the house. That is true. There's no vinyl in here. Right. If they know that you need to be getting back. Yeah. Okay. Well, how do we sell it? Right. It's just like, yeah, just like we'll still export DDT to developing countries. Um, and, uh, oh, and that's, yeah, you'll, you'll see that even with like, um, I mean, IKEA cabinetry, you know, back in the day when we first started being concerned about formaldehyde, IKEA was one of the few places where you could get no added urea formaldehyde um, products because they were complying with European legislation because they wanted to sell in Europe and they didn't want two different and, you know, manufacturing processes just so they could sell their high emitting stuff here in the United States. So it's one of the reasons that, you know, I bow to California, for example, they're at the head of um, a lot of this health based uh, legislation. And they're also the seventh largest economy in the world. So if manufacturers want to sell their products in California, they better well make their farm formulation to comply with California Air Resources Board and, you know, 01350 regulations so that um, so they can do so. So um, yeah, I'm go California, go West Coast. Yeah, okay, we're at time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Kurt. Um, next we have Dr. Heidi Whitman with GreenPod. Um, she comes to us all the way from Fort Townsend. So thank you for joining us today, Heidi. <laughs> Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Heidi Whitman, um, as Brian already said. I am a naturopathic doctor. Is there anybody who doesn't know what that is? Awesome. <laughs> the Northwest is great, you guys are so educated. Uh, California was rough because nobody really knew what a naturopathic doctor is or does, and so it was kind of hard to have to explain over and over again. Yeah, for the short people. <laughs> Better? Yeah. Hashtag vertically challenged problem. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I am going to talk to you today about um, some different. Oh, first, sorry. I'll uh, give myself a little bit more background here. Um, I have been practicing since 2005. Uh, I was practicing mainly in California for about the past 10 years. Um, moved back up here recently, and I'm currently not practicing. I'm taking a break. I'm having a blast working with GreenPod um, because I've been a green design nerd forever. And so I'm having a really fun time um, in this world. And I'm so happy that you guys are doing what you're doing. It's important. Um, all right. And what I'm going to talk about today is some special populations um, <laughs> that can really, really benefit from healthy homes. So these are your best customers. Hint, hint. <laughs> um, and and also because uh, Tor did such a great job of talking about the toxicology, I'm not going to you know beat a dead horse in that regard. Um, so basically, um, you know, again, these are your best customers; these are your target audience. Because um, I'll talk about more about why uh, in just a moment. So the two the two different groups that I want to talk about today are uh, people with asthma and allergies and eczema. Um, these people are in a group called um, people who have atopic disease. That just means that these are all sort of animals, uh, same animal with different spots. And in the research that I was doing on multiple chemical sensitivities, it seemed to me, again, same thing, um, same animal, different spots. And with maybe some other key differences biochemically, um, maybe also not only with um, issues with allergies, but possibly also with detoxification, which is the process where the body breaks down these toxic chemicals and gets rid of them, because we can do that to a certain extent. Okay, so in order to talk about these groups of people, so um, people with allergies and people with uh, multiple chemical sensitivities, I should talk first about the immune system. So immune system is our defense. So um, Basically what happens is when something comes into the body, immune system frisks it down. It says, what are you? Are you friend? Are you foe? Are you me? Are you foreign? What are you? And the immune system is set up to defend us against 
um, invaders like bacteria, viruses, parasites, um, possibly even plant toxins, you know, that, that come from the environment. It doesn't always necessarily know what to do with chemicals it's never seen before. Um, same thing, the body doesn't necessarily know how to detoxify chemicals we haven't seen before. So it can cause a lot of problems all over the body, as, as Sora already outlined. Um, but keep, just keep in mind one of the key points is that the immune system is everywhere, literally everywhere in your body. I'm not going to read you off that list. Okay. Another key point, too, is that, have you heard the saying, the dose makes the poison? Um, that's not always true. The dose and the response make the poison. So, <laughs> Tor's nodding. Um, so, humans fall into a bell curve of how we respond to any given thing. So, on one of the bell curves, we have Uncle Bob, who, somebody's Uncle Bob, who, ate, you know, a package of bacon every day, smoked three packs a day, and he only died in his 102 because he got hit by a bus, right? And he's the human version of a cockroach, can't be killed. <laughs> I hope he had a lot of kids so that we got some of those genes, but that's really not many of us. Um, the biggest area under the bell curve is, is most everybody who has, you know, some poor effects from toxins and some poor effects from allergens. Um, and then on the way in the spectrum, you know, the boy in the bubble can't tolerate anything, basically. Um, probably canaries in the coal mine, as Tor mentioned. Um, there's a saying in naturopathic medicine, in it's all about the terrain. Um, so what that means is that the body's response, um, how, how a person is affected by certain things, depends on their particular state of health, um, their particular genetic profile, uh, the state that they're in currently seeds fall on fertile ground. Um, if you're you're going to have the problem if you're predisposed to the problem. And that's where allergy comes in. Um, now, it's also not just all about the terrain in that everything that's happening in the environment with chemicals that we're exposed to, et cetera, et cetera, is weakening all of our, our systems just in general. Okay. So as far as the spectrum of things that can go wrong with the immune system. So on one, one end we have allergy. Um, you know, it can be anything as benign as, you know, pollen allergy, you know, people have hay fever, to uh, someone gets a molecule of shellfish and their throat swells shut, right? Um, we can also be allergic to chemicals. It seems pretty obvious. <laughs> I wish that fact could filter into our general Western medical society because they, they seem to not be able to comprehend that, um, which really doesn't make any sense. Um, um, all right. And then there's a, somewhere in the middle, there's autoimmunity. Does anybody not know what autoimmunity means? All right, perfect. Thank you. So autoimmunity is when the body in that process of frisking down something it's interested in, the immune system, it doesn't, it, it's distracted from or it doesn't recognize or it's triggered into thinking that a cell in our body is actually foreign. So um, probably everyone's heard of celiac disease, right? So that's where um, when somebody um, ingests gluten, the immune system mistakes, uh, it triggers the immune system to mistake the small intestine for gluten and attacks it and, just, and tries to destroy the small intestine. So obviously that's not great. <laughs> um, there are lots of other types of autoimmune diseases as well, rheumatoid arthritis being one of them, for example, where the body attacks the joints, probably due to a viral trigger, we think. Again, it could be very multifactorial. There could be chemicals involved. Nobody's really sure yet. Um, am I talking way too fast? Okay, good. Perfect. Um, and then a little red herring, but cancer is actually technically an under- activity of the immune system in that the body doesn't recognize a harmful mutation and defeat it. We actually get cancer multiple times a day, but our body knows how to say, hey, are you friend or are you foe? Wait, this is wrong. Kill that cell. Um, and when we're overwhelmed by toxins, you know, immune, um, immune overstimulators, you know, things like that, when a mutation sneaks through that process is when cancer can develop. Obviously, it can be encouraged, highly encouraged by chemicals. All right. So in terms of um, allergies, which is one of our special populations, so far, right, as, as of now, it's 30% of the population has some type of allergy. 
um, adult population, 40% of children. Um, and that's growing. Uh, part of that reason is, is the um, ubiquitous nature of antimicrobials in our society. So, for example, you know, kids that grew up on farms have a lot less incidence of allergic disease than kids who don't. Kids who have pets have less incidence of allergic disease. Um, because of that exposure early on, um, our, our immune systems learn to figure out, our, you know, oh, you're, you're a friend or you're okay, not foe, foe, foe. Um, and uh, um, so 8% of the population has asthma. Um, there's a ton of crossover in asthma and allergies, obviously. Um, there's a whole subset called allergic asthma. Um, what else? Worldwide, the incidence of multiple chemical sensitivities is between 11 and 16 percent based on surveys. So this is just um, either studies in clinics, in hospitals, or just um, you know a study center just calling random households throughout the U.S. Um, and asking questions that you know diagnose people. Um, or ask them to report, you know, do you react to chemicals in the home? Do you react to chemicals at work? You know, can you walk into the store, into the aisle where they have the cleaning products? And do you, did you get any symptoms from, from being exposed to these things? And self-reported, um, most of it, worldwide, 11 to 16 percent. So that's studies in um, the U.S., in Europe, in Korea, and Japan um, is what I found so far. Um, Again, my, my thought is, is that there's a lot of crossover in this. There's a lot of um, chemical sensitivities with actually a type of chemical allergy. So again, you know, our allergic people, um, not just in terms of helping to deal with allergies, but in terms of dealing with their chemical sensitivities, what you're doing is really, really, really important. Okay. Um, so as, as Tor mentioned, it, it, it's not necessarily just one chemical. Um, our regular Western medical system would love to just boil it down to one chemical at a time and try to study it from there, but we all know that that, that is impossible. It's not that, um, it's not that simple. It's not that black and white. Um, sensitization is the process in which the immune system um, becomes aware of a particular substance and becomes sensitized to it, meaning that it'll respond to it in some way, try to, try to get rid of it. So um, that can happen. I mean, we, we're not born being allergic to pollen. Like that happens at some point. Um, and so the sensitization process, it can be either chronic exposure, um, so long-term, all that formaldehyde, you know, leaking from wherever in the home, um, or it can be like a, an acute, um, like a one-time really big exposure. Either way, it can trigger the immune system to hyperreact to certain, certain things. Um, again, it's probably inherited. Um, um, because when they when they were doing the surveys and the studies, yeah, I think you can just click on it. Oh, maybe not. No. I'm not sure. Okay. Sure. Um, so what they did find in the studies of, of um, trying to find the rates of multiple chemical sensitivities is that there's also high rates within families. So it is familial, which tells me that it's probably also partly genetic and probably quite linked to allergy. Again, there may be a, some biochemical component of uh, inability to detoxify chemicals, um, but I don't know if anybody has looked into that exactly. Um, again, try to convince the Western medical system that we should detoxify. <laughs> Good luck. Um, so, um, a reaction to a chemical can happen obviously anywhere, anytime, anyhow, any place. Um, and, oh, even better. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, can you go Okay, thanks. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and the reaction can, can occur anywhere in the body. Um, because the immune system is everywhere, something can be anywhere. Uh, it can be from itchy eyes to upset stomach to um, rashes to brain fog to joint aches. It can just be a really like vague and sort of what they call a phantom, phantom illness, or it can be something really severe. Um, I know of at least two people who have been diagnosed allergic to formaldehyde. <laughs> One was my interior design teacher, 
that's probably not so great for her, is it? <laughs> so needless to say, she's a green, you know, green design convert, which is fantastic. Um, as far as petroleum goes, the two absolute worst cases of dermatitis I've ever seen in my life were a gas station owner and a formal oil rig worker. Because it's no coincidence. Um, there definitely is a petroleum dermatitis. Um, fragrances. Um, anybody here have to live in a fragrance-free environment? A few people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Depends on the type, right? Um, you know, essential, oh, side note, essential oils people can also be allergic to. One of the worst um, cases of just allergic reaction I've ever seen in my life have been to um, uh, essential oils as well. So they are not, they're wonderful, but they're not benign. Um, okay. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yes. So, um, no, okay, good. I'll make it. Um, this one? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. I'll try to <laughs> stay <laughs> okay. Um, so, again, it's a, in some ways, the dose makes the poison as well. Your body can become inundated and overwhelmed with toxins, for example. Um, you know, somebody living in a new home, you know, how many different types of chemicals are, are being off gas at once, right? Um, I'll give you myself as an example because I have a perfect case. <laughs> I had a, uh, okay, so in San Diego, there are a lot of issues with mold. And people will say, if you start talking about mold issues in the home, they'll say, oh, well, you live by the beach, you're going to have mold. Is that right? Right? <laughs> oh, it's so humid by the beach. In California? <laughs> So what is what is the correlation with proximity to the beach? Sorry? No, California, not Florida. <laughs> Deadbeat landlords. <laughs> Deadbeat landlords who know that they can flip that apartment in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, slumlord exactly. Um, so I've had to move twice because of mold. And uh, in both cases, it was easier to get rid of me than it was of mold. <laughs> um, third, third poor experience I had with mold was in a workplace, and they just actually hadn't found the source of the mold. But anyone else a human mold detector? Yeah? Okay. I charge by the minute. <laughs> so it doesn't take me long. Um, I had a workplace where um, I was actually getting visual migraines because the mold was so, to me, was so intense, even though nobody could really smell it. I was like, you guys, <laughs> I know you think you cleaned it up, but it's in the bathroom. I'm telling you, it's in the bathroom. It's in that wall. You don't really see anything. It looks fine. Oh, I'm telling you, it's in the wall. Sure enough, it was in the wall. The water had leaked not just into the ceiling, into the clinical or the treatment rooms, but it had leaked into the utility closet on that side of the bathroom wall. <laughs> it was in the bathroom wall. I knew it. Um, I could pinpoint it, like, exactly. Um, one of the apartments that I lived in, um, sorry, I know my own case best, so it's easiest to give you that example, but um, one of the apartments I lived in San Diego, again, you know, slumlord, um, the mold problem was so bad that I would get hives walking up to the front door, like head to toe. Does anyone ever have hives? Oh, it's not fun. And because my, my body and my system was so overwhelmed with the mold, um, oh, I have crap jeans too, and I'm also allergic to cold. <laughs> So when, when I had the issue with being overwhelmed and inundated with the mold, when I would swim in the ocean and my skin would get cold, I would get hives as if I'd been exposed to mold. So it just, it just exacerbated that reaction just so much because my poor, poor little immune system was just so overwhelmed. Um, so yes, I moved. I had to get out of there. Um, yeah, in any case. Um, so I had witnesses. <laughs> You know, when you climb out of the ocean, you look like the elephant man, like, you know, people see what's going on. Um, but a lot of people with multiple chemical sensitivities, they, they never get diagnosed, they don't get believed. Um, they're being gaslighted by their doctors, they're, they're telling, you know, they're being told it's all in their head. Um, and because the doctor doesn't really, it's not something they can, they think they can test for, they can't give you a drug for it. So they don't really want to talk about it, because there's nothing they can do about it. And if you read, there's a panel, some, some sort of scientific panel. I have all the resources if anybody wants to see it. But there's a scientific panel who 
um, uh, decided that multiple chemical sensitivities is uh, not really real. And they place heavy, heavy emphasis on the fact that there are um, high rates of mental emotional disorders in connection with the multiple chemical sensitivities. Yeah, okay, that's a great way to just completely dismiss people and not give them the help that they need. Like, that's not okay. <laughs> that's really not okay. And if by it's in their head, you mean that you can demonstrate blood flow changes and cognitive deficits with exposure to chemicals? Hello? <laughs> then yes, it's also in their heads. The problem is in their entire bodies. So we really need to not be dismissive of these people. Thank you. Okay. Um, and yet, hello, <laughs> scientific method causa causation versus correlation. Is the, is the multiple chemical sensitivities causing the mental emotional disorders or is it correlated? If, you, if your environment was suddenly hostile, if you couldn't live where you wanted to live, if you were the, the special kid at the party who has to be in the corner over here because somebody were wearing perfume over there, what is your mental frame going to be like anyway? You know, at what point are you not going to become anxious and depressed because you can't, can't go into a store, you can't go to a party, you can't you have to move out of your apartment, you know? Come on. Um, so, okay. Um, so, I know, Brian, you were saying you were interested in the costs. Well, here are some of the costs. Um, the one patient that I had was diagnosed by an allergist with a formaldehyde um, allergy. I don't know how he did it. Um, oftentimes, if a, if a patient goes into the office and, and asks for that type of testing, they don't get it. They get turned away. So patients have to be really, really persistent, and they have to get just the right doctor on just the right day in order to even be tested for these things. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that that happened. 13.5% um, of those with chemical sensitivities have lost their job because of it. That's what is 13.5% of 11 to 16% of the rural population? That's not good. Um, and yeah, people people can't live in a bubble. Look at this girl. Look how mad she is at <laughs> at the tree for making poly. Um, oh, three percent of people are actually technically diagnosed with multiple chemical yeah. All right, ready for the good news? <laughs> okay. Um, so I can't remember where I got the quote, but there is a point where green and healthy converge. Um, which is where you guys come in. That doesn't always happen, right? Green isn't always necessarily healthy. Um, if you build a really, really tight home, but you don't ventilate correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, or if you build you know, a lovely green home and oh, talk faster, and um, it's full of mold, yeah. Um, so uh, other things you guys might not have considered, just going back to general health or maybe people with allergies. Um, Light and noise pollution can be an issue. They can cause chronic stress, and chronic stress can make everything else worse. Um, most people probably know somebody who the first ray of light comes in the bedroom and they're like up for the day, and that's it. Um, so there are people you know, who we can help just with design in general uh, for their particular needs and for health in general. Um, so we, we can definitely treat people with multiple chemical sensitivities. We can help their immune system. The goal is not necessarily to make them tolerant of chemicals, um, but the goal is to make them healthier and be stronger and um, just be able to live their lives and have, have their immune system calm down to the point where they're not miserable constantly because of everything in the environment. Um, as you can see, there's a long list of things that we can do. I'm not here necessarily to plug naturopathic medicine, so I'm not going to talk about everything here, but I'm just going to talk to you guys about what you can do as far as design goes. Um, and building those to um, to help people. And um, to do that work. <laughs> so uh, speaking of detoxification, yes, detoxification is possible. Yes, detoxification is important, but it also should be guided and it also should be individualized. Um, because once you start stirring the dirt up at the bottom of the bucket, you better make sure you're washing out the bucket. <laughs> and there are ways to do that right, and there are ways to do that wrong. <laughs> the master cleanse is not the way to do it, I promise. <laughs> Just because it was on David Wolf or whatever, or Mercola. Um, okay, so um, 
Exposure to natural light is very, very important for our diurnal rhythms. And diurnal rhythms are important because our, our bodies are keyed to um, have optimal health with our pulses of hormone uh, release and hormone regulation. Night shift workers have higher rates of cardiovascular disease and cancer um, over um, you know, people who keep a normal sleep schedule. Um, and uh, that's the one thing that, that my patients would, oh, can I on this? <laughs> that my patients would fight me on is, is, you know, I hear a lot of people, oh, I'm a night owl because, you know, the house is quiet and I can get lots of work done. It's not good for you. <laughs> it's much better to get up early in the morning. And I guarantee you the house is quiet at 6 a.m., right? Generally, for most people. Um, I definitely will have more energy, and it's much, much better for your hormones, much, much better for your health in general. Um, so for most people who don't suffer from really bad allergies or really bad asthma, um, normal ventilation is okay. For those people who do have allergies or asthma and or the outdoor air could present a problem like pollen or um, wood smoke, you might consider, rather than having them open the window at night, um, consider like a really heavy duty um, air purification system for their rooms with a, definitely a HEPA filter. Um, and there might be something you think better. Um, black trees. Um, sleep areas should be dark, cool, and quiet. Um, are, how many of you put separate thermostats in bedrooms? Is that a thing? Yes? Awesome. Oh yeah, the infrared stuff. Those are awesome. <laughs> Anybody else doing that? Yeah? Okay, good, good. Perfect. Um, yeah, definitely noise pollution. If someone um, has a really hard time with noise, especially living in the city, um, you know, good insulation um, and in the ways of blocking out the noise is really important because sleep quality is really important as well. Um, has everyone heard of the study where um, people in the hospital get discharged earlier if they have a view of nature? At least a day. And most, most people heard that. Yeah. Was it a day or three days? I can't remember numbers very well. Um, anyway, it was significant. Right, so versus having to do a brick wall or something. Um, anybody have a chance to do anything like developments in city planning? Emphasizing walkable communities and proximity to farmers markets and um, grocers and things like that? Perfect, so that's also very important. Um, and uh, also for you know our social, social lives, um, it's not good for us physically to get in our car, in our garage, go to the store, go to the air conditioned store, get back in the car, go back in the garage. Um, it's good to get out and talk to people. Just on the way here, I saw a bench on the side of the road. I don't think it was a bus stop. And there were two, two guys just sitting there just talking away. And I thought, oh my God, that's great. We need more benches. <laughs> we need more places where, where neighbors can come together and socialize. It's important for our, our health. Um, as far as I'm aware, reverse osmosis filtration is the best thing for water. <laughs> Um, did everybody know that there's Prozac in tap water, and Viagra, and antibiotics, <laughs> and estrogen? Yeah, um, pretty much everybody has too much estrogen, period, more or less. Um, uh, yeah, proximity to fresh food, there's lots of different ways that we can garden um, even in urban environments. Um, and uh, does everyone already know that food that is, um, or vegetables and fruits that are harvested uh, locally are more nutritious than fruits and vegetables that are trucked in? Yeah. Okay, good. I don't know how much I'm preaching to the choir, <laughs> but anyway. Um, did everybody know that the best way to keep gluten out of your home is take your shoes off when you come in? Yeah, okay, good. Choir, all right. Um, carpet, I hate carpet. There's a person that allergies, I hate carpet. I hate it more than anything. <laughs> I hate it more than vinyl, just kidding. I hate them equally, um, but I hate carpet. Um, and also for asthmatics, um, uh, or anybody, so many people are allergic to dust. I can't tell you how many people I've tested. Hundreds of people and most of them are allergic to dust. So upholstery, you know, fabrics, not only the chemicals and formaldehyde, but um, uh, upholstery fabrics, um, you know, pillows, um, uh, bedding, mattresses, all that stuff just collects dust, 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 dust. So um, it's good to protect um, uh, yourselves from it with hypoallergenic bedding. If you can find it, that's also green and friendly. Um, and if anybody's driven around in a European village on a spring day during the day, you've seen all their duvets are hanging outside <laughs> over the balcony. 
Um, that's because UV and um, uh, ozone kill dust mites. So there's a good reason for that. Um, yeah, low maintenance materials that don't require chemicals. Um, so yeah, here's where I get to say thanks for being pioneers and doing what you're doing in the intersection of green and healthy. <laughs> Uh, urine, and then uh, going through the treat water treatment, and then it the water treatment doesn't filter it out. Yeah, it's gross. <laughs> <laughs> so use water filters. Um, any questions? Sorry, I'm a little bit over time, but nothing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I do appreciate it. Uh, first off, I am with Green Home Solutions. You see our table over here. Uh, as mentioned before, we are Seattle's only locally owned and operated green building material supplier. And I like to say that we are really the hardcore, really deep green building supplier. Uh, I don't consider Home Depot to be a green building material supplier, but I think we all know that we could walk in there and we might see some light green building materials. Uh, green Home Solutions offers sort of the richest and deepest and most thought out, uh, and really most evaluated and, and uh, most vetted building materials. Uh, a good example is when you come into our showroom and say, I'm here to look at carpets. We say, awesome, we have wool. And they go, oh, but I don't want wool carpets. You say, well, there's only one carpet in the world, and it's here, and it's wool. And they were told that synthetic fiber carpet was really healthy, really sustainable, and it was recyclable, or made from recycled products. And what they didn't tell me, and has been mentioned by the previous speakers, was that it was full of fire retardant and it was full of chemical dyes and all, all the other nasty things that we've been talking about. But the big buzzword was that, oh, well, it was recyclable or it was really green. So you really you know, can't buy it everything that you believe. But we've done a green home as we've gone out to all those manufacturers in the marketplace and said, well, we want to carry the greenest and most sustainable of those products. So again, when you come in, you see those products there. Uh, part of, well, first off, as a, who, who has not heard about Green Home Solutions here? Show of hands. One, two, a couple, good, good. I like to see that. Go marketing team. <laughs> that means that what we're doing and where we're at and what we're doing, why we're doing it, it's we're reaching the people that we need to reach. Uh, it's, it's more than just the green hippie people in Western Washington that really want to think and act local and be sustainable. We're reaching those people that maybe have never thought about a process or never thought about a product in their house. Uh, and so that is, that is really, really good. Um, what we like to encourage folks to do is to shop local. That is the epitome of sustainable living and, sustain, and, and being uh, and having a sustainable lifestyle is having a long lifestyle. Having something that you're going to be able to sustain your life today, tomorrow, into the future, or sustain the lifestyle in the future of other people who are in your building, their children. You know, I'm a product of the 70s and 80s. You know, there's a lot of chemicals that I've been exposed to. I drank a lot of lead in the water at Hamilton Middle School. Is that a problem with me now? I can tell you that I struggled pretty bad through high school with ADHD and trying to stay focused. Blame it on the lead? I don't know. But, you know, it is interesting to know that the chemicals that I was exposed to, many of our children today aren't exposed to those same chemicals. So that's kind of nice because they learn the hard way. And other generations, older generations, who have been exposed to chemicals way before us have other problems that are, have, have really come out in, in the woodwork. Um, a little bit about us as pros and you guys as pros and in the green building materials world is that we as professionals are called upon by people who don't know what they're doing. They are all calling us for our help. It is up to us to guide those people down the right path. And a good example of that is, you know, I'm here to look for a really durable floor covering. Okay, great. Name me two durable floor coverings. I'm going to say cork. I'm going to say linoleum. Oh, well, I was told vinyl was durable. Vinyl has phthalates in it. It, is an, it has all, all those chemicals that were up here 
are all found in those vinyl products. So we don't talk to folks about vinyl. If that went off, that's okay. Okay, thank you. Um, we tend to, as professionals, we tend to tell people about, uh, I'll use another example of decking products. So, okay, I'm, I'm here to look for a synthetic decking product, a composite decking product. Those are not environmentally friendly. They are made with PVC, they are made with wood dust, they're made with other chemicals. We don't have those products in our suite. So I can sell you wood. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and people say, oh, well, wood decking doesn't last very long. Or maybe there's other issues with wood. It's not sustainable. <laughs> yes, it is. We have FSC certified woods. Um, so there are answers to the common everyday products that you might find in your environment or in the building store when you go out and shop for them. Uh, and, and back to the pros being our responsibility. Uh, as green building suppliers, as green building consults, as architects, again, it's up to us to tell these people what we have, what we can source, where it is sourced, and how we can use it, and educate them. Educate them into vinyl being toxic or wool being a healthy material. And it is up to us to learn our materials. We have to know why wool is better than synthetic. Don't just tell people the why. You know, how come is it the wool carpets have been around for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and synthetic carpets have been around since the 50s? You know, the 50s, it's not that long ago. <laughs> you know, uh, wool insulation, the list goes on to natural products. Cork is another one. Uh, who knows what LVT is? LVT stands for luxury vinyl tile. It's the stuff that you walk into just about everywhere. And it's that super ugly looking monochromatic wood look. It's like, oh, there's the same knot there and the same knot there and the same knot there. So we are all being told that vinyl is a healthy, green, sustainable material. It's not. We're being lied to. And our answer to that is linoleum true old-fashioned linoleum that some of your great-grandmothers had. Some houses that I've torn apart that were built in the 20s in Seattle had linoleum in it, and it still looked great. Somebody covered it with vinyl in 1971, and after that we came back and we're like, oh look, there's the old original linoleum, you know. We've all seen some of the, the patterns of it, uh, and why it's not being used more is because we're told by our installer, by our, our, our designers, by our architectural communities that, well, it has to be wood grain. We want that beautiful wood, that reclaimed wood look, that rustic look, and we can't find that in linoleum. Okay, well, I can't find it in linoleum, but I'll find it in some toxic stuff. How about get away from the old rustic barn look of your floor? You know, pick a good product uh, that, and, and pick a good product that's healthy. I think we lose, we get out of touch with green being a really energy efficient, really sustainable, it's rapidly renewable, or it's, it's certified, it can be grown again. Let's talk about the health about our buildings. We live in really unhealthy buildings, and it makes us unhealthy. You know, unhealthy homes, unhealthy people. You know, happy homes, happy people, who's lived in a really unhappy house with people who are unhappy in it? It's not a very fun place to be. It's a toxic environment in terms of health. Well, it's a toxic environment in terms of the products that are, that are in there as well. Um, as a professional, I think it is up to us to hold our ground and to hold our spec. Uh, how many of you guys are professional architects, designers? Anyone? No? Okay. We see it a lot. I will see a professional green builder, and you know them. I won't know them by name, but you know who they are. And they will let a client or they will let a subcontractor talk them out of using a specific product. When you're the professional specifying a product, or you're the homeowner who says, no, I want to use linoleum. If the subcontractor or the installer or the supplier that you go to says, I'm sorry, I don't install linoleum, you say, sweet, have a nice day. I'm looking for someone who installs linoleum. Don't come to my home and tell me that, oh, you should really have vinyl. I called you for linoleum, give me linoleum. You know, you don't go to Starbucks and order a hamburger. You go to Red Melon order a hamburger, you know, and they give it to you, you know. So holding your ground and holding your spec as a consumer, I think, is really important. And the more we hold our ground and the more we as consumers demand the better quality products, the healthier products, the declare list is great. You're not going to find any vinyl products on that declare list. And as a matter of fact, you're not going to find any PVC product at all on that list, which includes your PEX pipe. 
you can't have a living future challenge building enough PEX pipe in it. You have to use copper, you know, because PEX pipe has vinyl in it, you know, plastic. Uh, and that's the stuff that we've all seen. Um, know your products. Know the story behind the products. I hit on that a little bit. But why is vinyl toxic? Why is an uncertified wood, so let's talk decking, for example, why is an uncertified piece of wood from the tropical regions really that bad? What's going on when I buy a non-FSC certified decking product out of the tropical versus I buy one that is FSC certified? I think uh, time on the market is a big part of products. Linoleum's been around for 150 years. Cork has been used by the Romans. Cork has been used as a flooring product for hundreds and hundreds of years. Who's wearing Birkenstocks? Are your feet wet? <laughs> you know, have they worn out in three years? How old are those Birkenstocks? We get all the time, oh, cork can't be very durable. You go, well, I got a guy in the third row who's been walking in his Birkenstocks for 15 years, and that's a cork <laughs> bed. Cork. It's not plastic, it's not vinyl. It's not made by sketchers in some poly, weird, conglomerated show. It's cork, you know? Um, so time on the market, I think, really is important. How long has wood decking been used? How long has your composite decking been used? Composite decking, maybe since the 90s, you know? I, I built a deck in 1980 with the wood. It's still around. <laughs> so I think that's a big, a big part of it. Um, I do want to get a little bit specific on, on alternatives to products. So vinyl flooring. Uh, is, 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 vinyl is everywhere. Sheet vinyl, vinyl plank uh, are some of the more popular ones. Uh, a healthier, more sustainable, better product alternative to vinyl is linoleum or is cork. When we're looking at those areas, where do we normally see vinyl? Vinyl's in the kitchen. It's in the laundry room. It's in the mud room. It's in the sport utility closet, uh, which is most garages. <laughs> no one parks a car in a garage anymore, so really. Um, and we put them there because we want something really waterproof, we want something really durable, and we want something to last a really long time. Uh, but we really want something to do all of those things and also be healthy for us and not hurt us in that environment. Linoleum is a perfect flooring alternative for your mud room, your laundry room, your mud closet, your kitchen, etc. Uh, when we look at places where we see linoleum versus where we might see vinyl, vinyl is pretty much driven into the residential market. We see linoleum in schools. We see linoleum in hospitals. Next time you hop on a ferry boat, look on the ground. That's not vinyl. That's linoleum. And you think about all the people that use a ferry boat <laughs> every day, day in and day out. When we also look at vinyl versus linoleum, we look at what it takes to maintain those products. The chemical components to take care of chemicals are often bad. <laughs> when you can treat linoleum with water or vinegar, you know, they don't need chemical products to clean them because they're already pretty environmentally friendly. And then when we also talk about the durability of those products in their care and maintenance, the ease in the care and the maintenance is, is a big part of it uh, and the life of that. So that means I've maintained it, I've, I've scratched it, everything's going to scratch and dent and ding, but I've maintained it and I can really still see the scratch and ding. So now I don't like it, now I'm going to throw it away, not sustainable. Some products like linoleum do repair better. Cork repairs better than vinyl. Uh, it's more like a wood product, so it's more forgiving, you know. Uh, to talk specifically about cork versus linoleum uh, or versus vinyl in some of those cases. You, know, you see cork in courthouses, in schools. Go to the Suslo Library, there's cork on the floor. Go to every building in the government sector back in the East Coast, all the DC buildings, a lot of your courthouses, cork tile, cork, cork, cork. Banks have cork, uh, not only for its quietness, for its noise, but for your standing on it. When you're back at the bank teller all day, uh, you've got a nice, softer, more friendlier wood product. Uh, they're easier to care and maintain. Most of them are cared for and maintained with traditional oil finishes and waxes. They go back to like Cinderella's days. Um, you know, not to the days of 40 years ago where Sven and Oli were playing with some plastic products, building ships, and said, hey, we should bring this in the house and put it on our floor. Swedish finish. That, that, that wasn't developed in Sweden. I promise you. It was literally developed here in the Pacific Northwest by shipbuilders who were taking 
very heavy chemical-based plastics that they were using on their ships. And they were bringing them into the home, thank you, they were bringing them into the home because the lady of the house out here in the Pacific Northwest, we build with a lot of fur, vertical grain fur. We all love it. We all know the wood, it's all beautiful, but it's also very soft. 1930, they had oil and wax finish on the floor. Bottom line, mom got tired of waxing and oiling the fur floors because they look like crap after a few days, especially here in the Pacific Northwest with all the water and the mud and the grit on our shoes and the logger husband and the fisherman, you know, on the whole deal. So they said, well, here, let's just mix these two chemicals and let's put it on the floor and we'll have this really, really bomber sort of plastic finish. When you look at the technology behind uh, and the science behind Swedish finish, what it is is a catalyzed varnish. It's two components mixing to one. They move around at a couple trillion miles an hour and then they stop. And then from that point on, they're chemically locked and they sit there and off gas into our air, into our environment all day, every day. They get worse when the sun is on them and they don't get any better when the sun isn't on them or when the heat is off or when the coolness is off. It's always there, always present. Uh, that's why you'll see most of your petroleum based products that you see in the market go yellow. You ever seen like the RV handle or the plastic PVC decking thing that's got that yellow nasty look to it? That's because the petroleum products that have been off-gassing for so long that they've deteriorated. They've changed the complexity of the plastic, the molecular structure of the plastic. And then you go to touch the thing and it falls off in your hand. It becomes brittle because everything basically has off-gassed away from it off of it and you're left with junk basically. The stabilizers, all those plasticizers and stabilizers are gone now because they're in my skin. They're in us. And they are in us. All of us here has her little uh, thing, thing kind of proved there. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, get away from the vinyl a little bit, uh, talk about wool carpets and synthetic carpets. Uh, how many of you folks have lived with a wool carpet or seen a wool carpet in action? So some few, right? How many folks have had like that super nice wool Filson jacket or know that your grandpa had a super cool wool Filson jacket, you know, still the same wool Filson jacket. I have one that's really old school, still runs great. How many have seen the sheep running around in the field and the water just beating right off of it naturally, right? You look at this, you look at wool where we use it commonly, clothes, jackets, especially going way back. Uh, you know, when, when you were exploring and things like that. We didn't have Patagonia H2 No yet. We didn't have these plastic fibers that they could weave really tight. And we certainly didn't have the chemicals like Scotch Guard and Rain Guard and some of the other ones that we put all over our clothes to make that super durable coat last one hour longer in the rainstorm. But we all know that wool, we've seen wool in history, go way, way back where you can stand out in the middle of the field for hours and hours and hours with your really, really wet jacket, but you will still thermally have the R value, the insulating value of that wool jacket. Cotton gets cold, gets wet, gets cold. Most of your synthetic plastic fibers do terrible with water and wind. Wool tends to stand out. So we look at wool carpet. Uh, we look at wool insulation. You know, wool carpets have been around way before any plastic composite was. And when we look at insulation, we've been using natural products, cork, using wool in our walls and in our buildings for a very, very, very long time. Wool is not treated with anything. Wool is naturally fire retardant. Wool holds dyes and, and stains and chemicals when we try to color our wool better than any other type of fiber. Most of the wool carpets that you're going to see at Green Home Solution are not dyed. So they are actually the color of the hair of the wool in the sheep on the ground. And there are black sheep, and there are brown sheep, and there are creamy colored sheep, and there's not really too many pure white sheep. <laughs> okay? So when we look at fibers, when we look at products, that's part of it. Who really needs purple carpet? Who really needs to have blue carpet? Who really needs to have these patterns that are weaved into carpet with chemical dyes and processes? Let's look at the beauty and kind of find the beauty within those natural products, wool, you know, uh, and some good examples over at our table and in our showroom of, of wool carpet. I think some other things to point out about wool is that it's, it's, it's structural integrity of the fiber. Most synthetic fibers, first off, when you take a synthetic fiber, it's plastic, and it's filled with hundreds and hundreds of these little holes. 
So how many of us have had spills on synthetic fiber carpet and you're down there just scrubbing it and scrubbing it and then you get this bucket of chemical that says do not use around children, not safe for animals and pets. And we're going to scrape it all over the carpet. We're going to keep scrubbing it because the kids spilled some cocoa. And we come back three days later and there's that cocoa stain that starts to become free again. And we can't ever really get it out. It's because that cocoa is trapped like a sponge in those thousands of those little holes. Wool, like our hair, is a solid fiber. It's naturally very hydrophobic. Water won't absorb into it. So normally your cocoa or normally your, hop, or your wine or anything for that, for that matter go into those. So when we look at that as a carpet product, we look at the fibers that are very strong, right? So synthetic fibers are really, really spiral and they tend to break apart really quickly because what happens to the plastic when it ages? It gets brittle. So now we've got brittle, tiny microfibers of plastic floating around all over our air. We're sucking those in versus wool, which is a natural fiber that doesn't break down. Wool takes a lot to pull it apart. Try to pull your own hair apart. It's pretty strong stuff. Um, and last I checked, I wasn't allergic to my wife's hair. Thank goodness. <laughs> I get it. It sucks if you're allergic to wool. That, that's a bummer, you know. And at that point, I think you just don't get carpet. Because if you're allergic to wool, I really hope that you're super allergic to synthetics. Because how can something be healthier in a synthetic product than in a natural product? I just, I just don't, don't see that. Um, and then when we talk about wool insulation versus fiberglass, you know, wool is naturally fire retardant. Uh, wool does not burn. It self-ignites, just like our hair. Uh, the protein fibers do that. When we look at fiberglass insulation, when we look at other fiber or other synthetic fiber products, uh, it is known, and any fire department will tell you this, a home that has wool carpet in it and a home that has wool insulation will typically survive a fire, even a catastrophic, like major fire, whereas a home that is filled with synthetic carpet will be almost always a complete loss. And that's because the synthetic fiber, once it reaches a flash point, it doesn't burn. It literally flashes. And then the fire department, as they go in with their hoses and spray it all around, tends to push a lot of that flame and that plastic around. We've all seen plastic burn. It's pretty cool. It's colorful. It's awesome. It's toxic. You know? But it does burn really, really rapidly. Wool does not. So that's another nice benefit without being treated. And that's why I have to treat synthetic products with fire retardants so they won't burn. Let's start with a natural product that naturally won't Right, or melt with heat. Uh, and that leads us into the decking world of wood and synthetics. Um, everyone has been on a plastic deck, right? Trex, some of the brand names out there. How many have been on them and gone, oh, ugly? Maybe some people have found some synthetic beauty in it. Most people, let's be honest, they're ugly. Right? Yeah. And they sag in between the joists, you know? Yeah. They're hot as hell. I mean, to the point where they're like, yeah, this is nice. I'm really enjoying our beer out here on your deck. I should probably wear some, get me some shoes, you know. I do know of a, of a couple real kind of horror stories of young children walking out onto the deck in Lake Chelan, right, a lot of hot, but they got to build a synthetic deck over there because it snows and it rains and it's really hot. You don't need to use synthetic deck. Long story short, young child went out, basically stood on the deck, started to scream. Parents were like, what's going on? What's, what's wrong? Her entire feet blistered so bad. She had like second degree burns on the bottom of her feet. It gets into the age thing, right? I got tough soles. I walk around barefoot a lot. That child was three or four years old. Her feet were so tender. And I think we've all seen it. We've been on those decks where it's an 80 degree day and your deck is 95 degrees or 125 degrees. Who wants to sit at a picnic table on a 150 degree slab? Like, no, thank you. You know, I'd much rather sit on a wood deck. I'd much rather appreciate the, the natural qualities and beauties of wood. Nothing is more relaxing than sitting on a nice wood deck looking at a view to me versus sitting on a really synthetic plastic deck looking at a brick wall. You know, I'd rather sit on a wood deck looking at a brick wall than a plastic one any day. And then when we talk about the, the, the in use, you know, if there's a huge amount of embodied energy in synthetic decking products, there's a huge amount of chemicals in those products to keep them stable. We talked about PVC and phthalates and some of the other stuff. Um, what happens to a plastic deck when you take it to the dump? What are they going to do with it? They're going to stack it in the corner. 
Your wood decking, unless it's been treated with like pressure treated and stuff, most of your natural wood decking, they're gonna say, oh, we'll take that to the clean green pile. We're gonna mulch that up and put that into another product. I think a lot of things that also happens with natural decking products is we tend to have more of a sustainable look on them in terms of, well, maybe I'll pull up the deck and I can reuse it. Can I pull up the wood deck? It's not a good walking surface anymore, but can I build a chicken coop out of it? Can we maybe burn it? You know, can we have a campfire with it? Um, you know, your synthetic deck, and you're like, great, we have to take this to the dump. There's, we're not going to build a chicken coop with it. You know, we're not going to recycle it into a fence or a gate, something cool with it. We're going to be like, yeah, this deck's got to go. You know, we're taking it to the dump. So, um, and then I think when we really look at who are we supporting by buying these products, who pioneered the composite decking world? <laughs> Go on a limb and say it was the petroleum industry, Dow Chemical, some of those other players that were heavily involved. In it. Who started the wood decking industry? You know, men and women hundreds and hundreds of years ago when they were building ships and using wood, you know, for their decks, you know, your steps, your porches, everything uh, was very wood based. So um, I just got the stop sign. So, <laughs> so I'm going to stop, but I would welcome any questions, comments, concerns in the back. That's a great question. So cork is a very sustainable material, natural material. Uh, to answer your question directly, it takes about 20 to 25 years for the cork tree to regrow the cork that was harvested. Uh, there is no shortage of cork trees. There are no shortages of cork. As a matter of fact, we as consumers need to buy more cork products. Uh, the reason being is that, well, I'll say a little bit of a story is that 10 years ago, everyone heard that cork was going to vanish and the cork trees were all dying you cut cork trees down to harvest them, not true. You peel the cork bark of the cork tree off of that tree. In Portugal, it's one of the highest, highly respect, highest paid and most highest respected agricultural jobs in the world. The reason being is because the cork tree is so delicate that when they peel that cork tree off, they have to ensure that they don't damage that cambium layer. That is the cork, the lifeblood of the cork tree. Uh, there are cork trees that are well over 200 years old, and they have harvested from that same tree over and over again. So the world of cork, uh, fear of cork running out, was put out there by the wine industry for the synthetic cork industry, putting plastic in your wine bottles. Mm -hmm. The reason being is because you cannot age a bottle of wine unless it has a real cork in it, because real corks breathe. So... Uh, they wanted you to be able to age your wine, but they also realized that a lot of consumers don't age wine. The other big sort of ploy behind that was who wants to buy a $95 bottle of wine and twist off the tap, right? No one. You want to have the whole sexiness of, hey, this is really rare bottle of wine, we're going to pop the cork, versus, oh no, we're just going to twist this sucker off and pour it. The truth is, is that you can buy a $100 bottle of wine with a twist cap because you're not going to age it. It's all about aging it. So plenty of cork around, plenty of cork. I have a question about um, other natural fibers and the cork in the world. It's a great question. So uh, we will see silk woven into some wool carpets. Pretty <laughs> pretty. Uh, I have I have not seen hemp, but the backing of a lot of the carpets is jute, and that's hemp. You know, jute, you have to think of hemp and jute being really, really tough fiber. So they use it more for the industrial quality strengths of it than they do the more softer, more delicate touches to it. But it is what gives wool carpet its durability. And, you know, I've seen wool carpet 30 years old and still look really, really good. You'll never find a synthetic carpet much past five years. You know, I've had a lot of carpets like that. Yeah. You know, bamboo, bamboo fiber is definitely uh, a very versatile fiber. They can make paper out of bamboo. Um, I've seen clearly, you're walking, you're sitting and standing on bamboo floor, and now I have seen some bamboo clothing, you know, shirts and things like that. Um, 
is it sustainable or what they're doing with it? I know that uh, bamboo is very rapidly moving lower. Uh, I, I know that in terms of cotton and the process that cotton has to go through to turn it into this nice, well, this is wool sweater, but to turn it into these pretty sweet jeans is not a super clean process, you know. Um, so, good thing to research on some of that. And over here. The process of making fiber out of bamboo is actually not super clean, unfortunately, mm. sadly. Fiber, but it's not very clean. It's not very clean. Um, what about bamboo flooring? Is there any type of bamboo flooring that's like okay for super? Uh, I mean, so short answer, no, because we're not taking, you know, we're not taking a strip of bamboo and like laying it down. We're taking a strip of bamboo and we're stacking it together and then putting a bunch of glue with it. So are there ones that are, are as Taurus presentation had, are there third party verified? to be more toxic or less toxic than others? Sure. Are there ingredients in those products that we don't know about yet? Yeah, pretty, pretty sure. I'm a pretty hardcore green guy. I don't really like bamboo floor. I mean, I, I don't have it in my home. I, I've seen it wear and tear pretty well, but then I always tell people, it's great flooring for a grass, but how long have we been walking on grass flooring? Since the 90s. That's it, you know. Yeah. They use bamboo a lot for structural, Work. You've seen scaffoldings and things out of it, but for flooring, it's pretty new. So, yeah. um, wool and moths. Wool and moths, great question. Yeah, so, you know, uh, some folks will have really bad problems with moths. I think it really depends on your home and where you live regionally. Most wool carpets, we have, we have one line, but most, most wool carpets are treated with pyrethrins. Uh, pyrethrins or pyrethrins are developed from the chrysanthemum flower, and what they are is they are a moth egg inhibitor, so they dry out the moth egg. The simplest and easiest and way to assure that you never have a, wolf, uh, a moth problem, it's really heavy, heavy maintenance, vacuum your floor. That's all you have to do, just vacuum your floor. Another really cool thing about wool and, and like to, to, to care and maintenance is that wool won't hold a static charge, synthetic carpets will. So when you walk into the home that's buzzing, <laughs> look at the carpet. It's probably, there's literally electrical pulses, there's electricity in your synthetic carpets. Everyone as a kid walked around, and then you can't do that with wool. So dirt will stick to a synthetic carpet. With wool, it literally rides on the surface and you can suck it up with very little suction. That's why your vacuum has that feeder bar. You have to beat the dust out of that carpet. Back here. 100% wool. We have no foam. Again, there's really no healthy foams out there. You know, they're just, they don't exist. Wool carpet pads. Back in the day, they used wool and they would use horse hair for a lot of products. Unfortunately, no. We read the question. No. Uh, the question was, if you have an existing vinyl flooring already, what can we do to sort of mitigate it or encapsulate that? You, you can't. You, you can cover it with plywood and put another linoleum over the top or do that, but it's still there. There's no magic eraser, Mr. Clean coating that you can rub on the vinyl and get rid of the chemicals from it. So get it out of the house. Yeah. Um, so I'm re realizing that my childhood home is full of synthetic carpets and vinyl, and... Me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hug it out, bro? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for real. Um, and this might be a question for you as well, or um, or Tor. Um, hi to your Tor. Uh, are there any ways to detoxify your body from synthetic fibers and chemicals? Like, oh. Clint, like, mm, mm. Yeah. A building materials cleanse. <laughs> yeah. Is it like diet? Like. Yeah. Gastro. Yeah. Okay. Get to that. Yep. Plant based. Yep. <laughs> Favorite product? Oh, wow, good, great question. Favorite product at Green Home right now? Oh, man, you might have stumped me. 
Uh, well, so I'm kind of really into like super, I would say, uh, I'm super into hyper local. I like to call them hyper local products. So we really are this hyper local products to me is like you literally can find a product, a butcher block, for example, siding that came from less than 500 miles away from the door. That's pretty hyper local. Uh, we do have a product. Thanks, Doug. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see this, but how many have heard of the term Soshugiban? Little Japanese session right now. Awesome. So this is a process of burning wood. When you burn wood, you collapse the wood cells. You forever change the structural integrity and the absorption of the wood cells. This is nothing new. The Japanese guys were doing this like 2,000 years ago. Uh, there are historical buildings that are noted and marked. You can go tour them that are well over 600 years old in the mountainous regions of Japan. And all they have on their siding is burned wood. So this is probably my favorite. Uh, a little bit of the background, it's 100% FSC certified. It is grown, milled, sourced, produced, the entire story on Blakely Island, which is up in the San Juan Islands. So a very neat story. It's a privately, privately owned island, and the landowners there, uh, I don't know how many years ago, let's just call it 100, the entire island was stripped of all of every tree on it. And it's what basically built the San Juan Islands. Uh, a lot of those islands were just cut down so they could build Rosario build ships and build all those nice homes that are up there and cabins and things like that. And now a lot of it is second growth. It's very, very beautiful. It's very dense. And because of its growing environment, being in that much soil, you know, on a rock, the wood is very, very hard and very dense. It's, people think of fur like, oh, it's going to be really soft. But island fur, very different. Yeah. So. That probably gets my favorite, though. It definitely does a lot more. Yeah, it, it's cosmetic, but uh, it's the treatment of the wood, collapsing the wood cells, uh, the level of char. Next time you're on a beach walk, pick up a beach fire piece of wood and go dunk it in the water and pull it out. You'll see the part that's not burned will be really wet, and the part that has the char on it will literally be dry. Uh, charcoal filtered, who's heard of that? You know, <laughs> right? There's, there's a lot there. But yeah, next time you pick up a chunk of coal, throw it in some water, kind of play with it. It, it won't absorb water. Uh, I don't know that. I don't know that. I mean, I know that there's there's certainly the amount of like cutting wood is you know cedar is really carcinogenic. You know, you don't want to be using that like, e-peg will get people around. There's all sorts of different things there, but uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I know we typically find Shoshugiban with uh, cedar, cypress, and fir are probably the most popular woods that they do it in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question of me? None. <laughs> and we're lucky, we don't have too many termite problems, but we do. I mean, we, we get into them. Um, your uh, Tropical wood products tend to be pretty termite resistant, but I mean, wood in general is not very termite resistant. I think it's, there's, there's certain things you can do when you build a deck, ground contact and kind of working with some of those things, care and maintenance. You know, termites take a long time to really do their damage. If you catch them, catch them quickly. Um, but most of your harder, denser tropical wood products are a little more pest resistant than say cedar, for example. What else? Okay. Awesome. Thanks for sticking it out, guys. Appreciate it.